So we're looking at some images on the screen behind us, and I think they're just going to flow while we talk. Yeah. Is that the idea? Um, so we're both alums of this program. Um, you were here first um, before I came, and we didn't quite cross paths. Um, but you've designed for stage, both Broadway and opera, and for film. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about how these forms are different for a designer, and how are they the same? Right, so um, it's interesting, because my, um, uh, my thoughts on that have evolved. I started as a theater designer uh, in this very theater, actually, and, um, uh, and then worked, uh, went to undergraduate school here as a theater designer, and then graduate school as a theater designer, moved into New York, started my uh, theater career. So worked for years as a theater designer before uh, this sort of strange coincidence of me moving into film happened. And that was, I think, 1981, when I did the stage version of Come Back to the Five and Dime, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. And then asked to do the film version and started doing film. So I think because of my theater background and the way I thought in terms of uh, storytelling, I, um, when I made that transition, it never occurred to me that there was any difference other than the fact that uh, there was a fourth wall to design, and that uh, usually sort of more sets, right? But the the whole the whole process, the whole evolution of how um, I designed was very much as a theater designer. You know, you read the script, you. Um, in meeting with the director, you decide what the language is going to be in how you're going to express yourself in creating the environment or the world of the story. And, um, and in my case, usually keeping it pretty simple. And, um, and so it never, I always said that it was very much the same process. You have a bigger team that you work with. You are designing more sets. You're designing sets, and you're finding locations. So it's a kind of a bigger world or a bigger job to handle. but. Um, very, very much the same process. So the last time I designed something on stage was 1998, I think I'm going to say. Yeah. I did a production uh, that John Malkovich directed at the Steppenwolf Theater of a play called Hysteria. And, um, and then at that point, it was all film. Up until that point, I was going back and forth between film and theater. But up to that point, uh, after that point, it became all film. Until last year, when I got a call from the director, Peter Sellers, asking me if I would design this new opera that he was doing with John Adams at uh, San Francisco Opera called Girls of the Golden West. And um, all of a sudden, sort of sitting down to design a set for the first time for the stage in, uh, what is that, 20, 20 years almost, um, I realized that it was in fact quite different. That, um, I mean, one of the things that I've enjoyed about film is that uh, as a designer, although there's a lot of discipline, you can also be, um, you have a chance to improvise a lot. You know, you film over a series of anywhere from uh, like a short shoot of 30 days to a long shoot like Life of Pi for 120 days. And so in that process, A, you're designing all along the way, but also you have the opportunity for the camera rolls to make adjustments and change things as you see how the, you know, how the story is, is shaping. Um, but in theater, you don't do that, do you? You have to... Um, you have to get your mind together and complete. In the case of the opera, uh, we presented the design for the opera, um, boy, when was that? Uh, last August, I believe, earlier, in May, and then started building in, uh, started building in May, and then we had our first technical rehearsal back in August, and 
then went away and didn't come back to the set in the story until uh, just last week. So at any rate, I realize that the process is, is this long-winded? No, please oh, all right. still <laughs> So I realize that the process is quite different and that, um, you know, in a way, what you're designing is you're designing this little jewel and all of your tension and all your energy goes to what that image or what that vision or what that world is going to look like. Um, and it's the same thing in film, but in theater it's much more finite just because of the space you're in and the way it's experienced by the audience. So quite different, quite different, but still, uh, as a designer, emotionally, you're going through the same thing. You're trying to find a way, the best way to tell the story. And in my case, I know uh, not always necessarily the case. In my case, trying to keep the focus at all times on the character and the words, which is why I think I tend to, um, I, design wise, I always try to edit out all of the noise and um, so that it's very clear where the audience is meant to put their focus. That's um, that. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the students are interested in what your path was from leaving here until right. you wound up you know, in film. Right. Um, what, if students aspire to be, to achieve things like this, what might your advice be as they leave school and start their careers? Uh, well, I mean, in my case, I benefited from a really great education. And um, as you know, I started as a student here. And um, my professor, Erickson Conan, and his wife, Marianne, surprised me by showing up today. So, um, <laughs> so I'm 18 years old all over again. Thank you very much. Um, uh, but so, and I want to tell that story. But first, we'll just talk sort of um, about what happened after my education. But it is, in fact, because um, I was inspired. I was inspired by Erickson Conan when I was here, and I was inspired by Ming Cho Lee when I was at the Yale School of Drama. So I came out, I think, with a very, uh, with good skills, but more importantly, the knowledge of how to look at things. Now, I, I say this a lot. I think, um, and this is true if you're a director or you're a choreographer or you are a costume designer or whatever career path you choose. It doesn't even have to be related to film or theater. But, um, you know, a good deal of your success is sort of who you are inside and um, the story that you have to tell. But you can't do that unless there's someone, um, I don't think, uh, guiding you. And like I say, here that guidance was not only just all the practical and technical skills that you need to work in, um, in our profession, uh, but also, um, I'll probably get emotional. <laughs> it's um, it's that uh, that guidance for how to be a good person when using those skills, and um, and so that's just sort of a how to be a good person globally, but also how that relates to how you interact with other people and um, to find that way of, um, of what, of 
I'm going to keep saying the same thing until it gets tedious, of telling the story, right? Because to me, that's what's so important, and that's what I love about what I do and what one has the opportunity to do in this field. And, um, and telling that story has a lot to do with how you interact with directors, uh, with producers, um, and even in school, that is you know, the university or the, or the theater department or film department. Um, so right now I got off topic because you wanted me to talk about what happens when you get out. What happens when you get out is um, you have to be good at what you do, right? So you have to use all of the skills and all the knowledge that you got in your education. And um, I mean, I was lucky enough, um, I went to a graduate program that uh, where when you design productions there, they're seen by New York critics and New York directors and producers. So I left school already with um, opportunity to uh, design for the Guthrie Theater and um, the Folger Library Theater because of connections I had made and people who had seen my work when I was at Yale. Um, that's not the only way to sort of progress in a career, but um, I would say in New York theater in a tight-knit community, uh, that certainly helped me um, uh, sort of build my career. And um, early on, uh, I, d I didn't do a lot of assisting as a designer because um, I was lucky enough to have uh, some paying jobs. As a, as a set designer, but um, I did uh, assist Robin Wagner, the wonderful uh, Broadway designer, uh, on a couple of shows, and uh, David Mitchell, another wonderful um, set designer in New York. Um, and, uh, but one of the first interviews I had was with Santa Laquasto, who if you, you know, if you know uh, theater design, but also film design, he's, pretty much uh, Woody Allen's sole uh, production designer. Um, so I went to um, you know, worship at the feet of Santo and ask him uh, for a job assisting him. And he looked at my portfolio and he said, you haven't really designed a lot of shows. And I said, no. He said, well, I don't think you should be assisting. You better go out and design shows. And what, whatever opportunity, any little theater, any regional theater, any off-Broadway, opportunity you have, you better start designing sets and you better go do summer stock. So that's what I did. And uh, was lucky enough to keep busy. And um, <laughs> what, here I am today, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, I mean, I, you know, in terms of giving advice, it's really to sort of love what you do and be passionate about what you do and, and, um, and not stop trying. <coughs> you know, I am, um, uh, there's a little bit of a joke with me and my agent because um, I refer to myself as the reluctant designer. Um, and it's because I made a choice personally early on, given this advice from Santo, um, to sort of, uh, to work as much as possible, but also to pick and choose. Because for me, um, designing just anything for the sake of being a job wasn't fulfilling. I had to sort of love the material and um, be excited by the director and um, for me to uh, sort of take it. Now that's not, that's a little, that's the antithesis of Santo's recommendation, but um, I've been lucky enough to sort of keep working. That's good. <laughs> um, I have another question. It goes a little bit to the emotional thing that mm -hmm. you were talking about, as well as the fact that you're back in San Francisco doing a live stage design yeah. again. And, you know, you've had a lot of incidental connections with San Francisco, such as doing Buried Child, but doing it in New York. Right, you know, yeah. Or Sam Shepard, who came out of the Magic right. Theater here. And so I'm wondering if you have any 
I guess, thoughts to share about what it feels like to come back and do this now? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm going to uh, just, I'm not very good at anecdotes, but uh, the first play that I designed on my own, I assisted on a couple of plays here in the Little Theater, but the first place I designed of my own was um, Winnie the Pooh, directed by Robert Woodruff, who was with the Magic Theater at that time. And, um, and so, uh, but, well, no, he was a student at State at that time as well. And so he directed that production. And, um, and so I went off to New York, and Bob went off to New York, and he was coming to New York to do, we called him Woody, to do uh, Buried Child there. And so he called me up and asked me if I wanted to do Buried Child. And then we did a show at the um, uh, Goodman Theater as well, and then uh, Lincoln Center. So um, that was a very real connection that came out of my time here as a student at San Francisco State. So how does it feel? Very emotional. And you know, I was here in the spring and uh, talking to the design class right next door. And um, as John knows, that was very emotional. I hadn't been back to state in, in quite a while. And I certainly hadn't been in the design room or Kenneth Theater or the Little Theater. And, um, you know, those were four very, very good years of my life. And um, due in no small part to Eric. So uh, can I tell that story? Please. So um, all through, like, literally, elementary school on through uh, high school, I was always taken with the theater and um, acted probably not very well in any number of productions. And then when I got into high school, I realized I was really interested in um, art and mostly kind of commercial art. And so I continued to be involved in the theater department, but because of my interest in art, uh, I designed a lot of the sets in high school as well. So by the time I, um, but by the time I came to college, I decided I was just going to be an art major. That um, I actually thought that uh, theater was no way to make a living. So. <laughs> Uh, so, I thought that um, I better grow up and I better start taking classes, uh, art classes. And, and actually, I came to San Francisco with the intention of doing two years here in the art school and then transferring to like Academy of Art College or something like that in commercial design. Uh, but, um, so I arrived here as a freshman um, as an art major. And um, a student that I'd gone, a student who was here, who I'd gone to high school with in Los Angeles, um, who was an actor, said, um, "Oh, you know, you, there's this really wonderful. You like to do scenery." I said, "Yeah." And he said, "There's this really wonderful designer here who, te who teaches uh, set design." And I thought, "Oh, well, that sounds good. That's sort of like, you know, that's not like." the responsibility of being a you know, song and dance man or anything like that, um, that would be good. That would be you know, my love for theater and my love for design. So um, I walked into, uh, I must have walked into the office. Eric can probably help me with details here. Um, and I said, my name's David Gropman, and I'm a freshman here, and I'd like to take um, the design class if I could. And Eric said, well, that's not a freshman class. You can't take that. And uh, called my dad. And um, he said, you, you, you go into that teacher. And you just tell him, you know what? I don't need a credit. All I want to do is sit in the back of the class. You don't have to give me a credit. You know, I don't have to be involved. Just, you know, can I sit in? So I went back to Eric. Eric I think Eric says I went back three times. <laughs> before he finally said, fine, fine. And yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, quite frankly, um, if Eric hadn't taken me in, and really under his wing, I think, 
is how I felt. Um, I don't know where I would have gone from there, you know, what my career trajectory would have, would have been. Because um, again, uh, you know, I think Eric's reputation is somewhat legendary. And um, he's graduated a lot of wonderful students. And um, he was just absolutely, uh, means everything to me. And therefore, my time here means everything to me. And his lovely wife, Marianne. And, you know, they kind of welcomed me into their family and took care of me for four years. Really nurtured me. Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit, too. <laughs> I was here as a student also. Yeah. With um, special so thank you. person. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I think um, it just sort of uh, speaks to education, right? And to being a student. Um, it's important to seek things out and to, um, to make the, <laughs> this will sound like an ad or something, but to make the most of your time here. I didn't necessarily sort of come into come here thinking that, you know. In fact, in general, I'm a pretty lousy student. Um, but, uh, but Eric engaged me. And, um, and because of that, he made me want to be my best and to keep pushing and to, um, and to keep growing. I mean, I didn't come in with any talent to draw or draft, certainly not to watercolor, and um, but I became that person because I had a professor that encouraged me and challenged me to. So mm -hmm. I'm going to tell another funny story. So my wife is uh, I met at Yale School. <laughs> well, I mean I don't know if I've told any funny stories, but I'm going to tell you a funny story. So my wife um, is, uh, she and I met at the Yale School of Drama. We were in the same class of uh, eight students um, in 1974. And, um, and sort of soon after meeting, we became a couple. Um, when I was at San Francisco State, every year, there was USITT, which still exists, right? Mm -hmm. um, held a design competition. And uh, so Eric um, uh, encouraged me to uh, send in a, a set design. I think that year it was for um, uh, Tennessee Williams play Small Craft Warnings. And um, Lo and behold, a letter came back and I had taken second place, which I was very, very excited about. And then I noticed that there was, um, you know, I, I, I did have to look who had won first place. And I see that it's this woman from Wisconsin. And I'm thinking, how is that possible? So uh, first year class at Yale, um, uh, um, Ming Cho Lee is giving a uh, talk on collage. And uh, after the class, Karen says to me, oh, that's so funny. You know, I did this design for a play that was collage, and I didn't even realize what collage was at the time, and won first place at the USITT competition. <laughs> And a couple of years ago, she framed her certificate and her ribbon, and she got 50 bucks um, just to keep me in my place. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great story. Um, so looking ahead um, to seeing your opera, what is it, next week? Uh, final dress is Friday, and then it opens on Tuesday, the 21st. Right, and I'm going to see it Friday. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Um, how is it working with 
um, the shop there now. Uh -huh. What is it like uh, there? I know that there have been some changes and that they don't do as much building here as they used to, and I'm wondering if there's any of that. Well, so, uh, so I think like contractually, all of the opera is built by the San Francisco Opera shop. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a choice, and um, they're not inexpensive. So um, just sort of like everything, there was um, sort of that negotiating with the budget. And uh, uh, as you'll see, the set is fairly minimal. But um, and so I thought, well, there's no way I could be spending the budget no matter what, because I just don't have that much scenery on stage. And you know, my impression is that opera houses are uh, opera operas are always filled with, uh, are always stages filled with scenery. And this one is not. Uh, but, you know, still there wasn't enough money to do what we needed to, not, uh, everything we needed to do. Um, but uh, I think we got pretty close to where we want to be. The construction team and the painting team and props were all fantastic. Really, really great. And um, it's a wonderful stage crew. Almost all the scenery is moved by hand on stage, by stage hands, and they're like these beautiful dancers. I mean, they just move the stage scenery so beautifully. So that's all been a really great experience. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, connections with San Francisco Opera. Um, uh, several of the people on staff in the costume shop are uh -huh. students, former students from here. Um, and Joan R. Helger, who teaches lighting here, right. um, is, was a lighting designer there. Yeah. Um, how is it working with, who is your lighting designer? And how is that so uh, the lighting designer is Jim Ingalls, someone also who I was at Yale with. <laughs> so, um, so I've known Jim for, I don't know, what is that, 40 some odd years. Um, although when we were at Yale, he was a stage management huh. student. So I've never worked with him as a lighting designer, but I've known him all these years. So that's great. Uh, the costume designer is another former uh, Yale graduate who I've done a lot of theater with over the years. So, um, so that's been sort of great. I mean, the team is someone that I know and uh, people that I know and that have worked with. So that makes all of that a lot easier. And, Peter Sellers is the most wonderful, uh, stimulating director you could ask for. And um, so it's been a really, I mean, I have to say, sort of stepping back into the theater and opera, which is something that I'm not all that uh, familiar with, um, uh, Peter has just made it so easy. and. Um, so much so that I'm going to do another opera with him in the summer at Santa Fe Opera. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm finally, uh, like, I'm back in the theater again. I have to say, for the last, um, I, would, I think I'm awful with years, but probably about now, maybe almost 10 years ago, I did um, a film version of the musical Hairspray. And um, because of the nature of doing uh, a musical, even though it was a film, it had that long rehearsal period, it had that work with the director and choreographer to sort of, you know, figure out just where everything was. And I realized at that point that I was kind of homesick for the theater. So ever since then, I've been thinking, you know, when, am I gonna get, when will I get an opportunity to do uh, a play again? And then fortuitous, fortuitously, I'm tongue-tied. This came up, and um, so I'm, I'm back on stage. And also at the same time, I've been asked to do these two um, uh, uh, sort of worldwide concerts. Um, this technology, uh, they call them holograms. So uh, one is an evening with um, Maria Callas, and one is an evening with Roy Orbison. So again. A different kind of use of the stage, but stage work again. Oh, that's interesting. An evening yeah. with Maria Callas. Pardon? Or an evening with Maria yeah, Callas. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Pretty it's, intense. It, it, pretty um, amazing. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I want to do is sort of bring it back around a little bit. 
Um, maybe we have some time for some questions. Great, yeah. Uh, no, I'd prefer that. Okay. <laughs> so and I was gonna, uh, uh, the question is, should we have some visual thing going on? Right. And it seemed to me that it wasn't really, I don't think we're all design students here, so I didn't wanna spend an afternoon talking about the progress of designing a, uh, film, but uh, this is a film I did a number of years ago with Ang Lee called Taking Woodstock, and it takes place at Woodstock in 68, so um, I just kind of love the photographs. The, you know, we got to recreate a lot of what's in the Woodstock documentary, and um, I don't know, it represents my youth, so. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, are there, who in the audience has any thoughts or questions you'd like to share? So, you know, when I think about opera, one of the first things that comes to mind is the set. Right. Because it's a, you know, it is almost commensurate with the performers. I mean, which is a rather unique thing. If you look at film, obviously you're supporting the actors, and it's critical, but it, Right. So you just described uh, this new set you built as kind of being minimal. Right. Do you feel that that is more of a trend that we're going to see? Oh, I mean, opera? you know, I don't, that I don't know. I know that Peter Sellers um, often likes to eschew scenery and uh, sort of Brechtian in nature and, um, also likes to challenge, I think, the audience by not giving them, not making the set tell the story, but making the singers tell the story. Um, so it was a good fit for me that way. But um, you're right. I mean, one of the things, um, and of course, I had only done one opera before, and one of the things that always made me anxious about opera as a designer is that responsibility of filling a really big volume. And um, because again, my focus has always been character and story and language. Um, so it was good for me that I had a director that didn't want a lot of scenery. Um, but at the same time, I certainly felt this responsibility for kind of harnessing the space and finding a way to, um, have represent the sort of, I would say in this case, more the emotional feeling of the California gold rush uh, in a big way, but also being able to just absolutely bring the focus all the way down stage, which is where Peter, I would say as a director, likes his singers to be. Yeah. But yeah, so you'll have to see the opera and tell me if it worked out all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, musically, it's stunning, I think, really stunning. John Adams is an amazing uh, composer, and, um, and the voices are really spectacular. Okay, so who else has questions? Yes. Did, did you uh, ever uh, have a design that you Well, um, I would say yes, and, but to that end, I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, like I say, I try to be careful with the projects that I choose and, um, and also the directors. So um, I don't do a lot of big visual effects movies, but, um, and when, uh, when Ang asked me to do Life of Pi, um, A, I had already worked with him on this film, which I felt very much in my wheelhouse. Um, Life of Pi, if it had been a different director, I don't know, I might have said, I might have felt like not up to it. Um, and it was an incredible challenge 
but because of the director, I wasn't worried. You know, I felt, um, I know that we're going to have a connection and um, that I would be safe that way. I knew that it was going to be hard. I was on the project for two years and almost a year before we went into production. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's good to put yourself out on the limb. But I like the safety net of knowing that I'm with a director that, um, that is going to support me. But good to challenge yourself. <laughs> the older I get, the less I want to challenge myself. But, <laughs> but I'm game. Right. It is about relationships between people, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. Um, and that's what goes on stage or into a film as well, and just because we're all human beings anyway. Yeah. That's where we go. Um, but it seems like your advice about being a good person uh, is something that I really hear. And uh, it's kind of important to emphasize that, I think, these days. Yes. Very much so. Because we have plenty of examples um, of the, of the of other What side. might be the other side. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, I'll tell you, it's interesting to me because, um, you know, I know a lot of other designers, and of course, you hear stories. And I know there are <clears throat> some designers that are, that might be, you might say, difficult designers that don't respect budgets. Uh, designers that, um, you know, you hear from art departments that, you know, not a pleasant, you know, working experience, and yet these people tend to continue working. Um, I tend to have a reputation of being on budget, and, um, I mean, I've had my moments, for sure, but um, for the most part, I think I get along with people pretty well. And, um, and that's kept me working. So I think you can be a sort of decent human being and, and, um, and cooperative and respectful of uh, budgets and, and still continue working. So of all the things you've done, what's your favorite? Do you have one? There's no favorite. No. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, you know, I mean, doing film, well, doing theater, of course, but film, uh, you travel around a lot, or I do, and, you know, you're lucky enough to work all over the world, and um, just about every place we finish a film, I think, wow, I could live there. So I don't know, you know, I mean, uh, luckily, most of what I've done have been really, really good experiences. And, um, and so I equate uh, films with, um, with the experience as much as with the way it looks. I mean, I, you tell me, John. I look at a lot of my work and I think, oh. <laughs> Well, it's hard <laughs> not, to look at your own. Not, not, so. not everything I wanted. Um, but, uh, you know, I've done a lot of films that have been great experiences. Um, I can say of Mice and Men was like one of the best times we ever had. So was Cider House Rules and The Shipping News and Chocolat, uh, Life of Pi. Um, lately, I've done a lot of, uh, like, boom, 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 a lot of things that had been stage plays made into films. Doubt was a really great experience, and, and, and Fences was a fantastic experience working in Pittsburgh and with Denzel Washington and working in, you know, the neighborhood where August Wilson grew up. So I don't, I don't really, I don't know, I don't think I have a favorite. Yeah, but it sounds like you enjoy working in film. I enjoy working in film and I really enjoy being the back in the theater. Well, so. Yeah. Um, it's good that you can do both, I think, because in a lot of ways they're very different, but as you said, in a lot of ways they're still the same. Yeah, there's no question that all of the, um, all of the skill sets that you have um, and all of your sort of intuition in terms of how to take a story and create a world, a visual world for it, it's very exactly the same. That's all the same. 
Um, sometimes I tell my students, you know, you have to imagine something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, um, do, do you ever find that scary? Uh, or do you, well, do you love that part? Uh, no, I find that scary. Yeah. I mean, in Life of Pi, um, I was absolutely comfortable with everything except for this island. I don't know if you know the story where uh, Pi spends one night with uh, Richard Parker. And um, I don't know, I, I very much like, I love doing research and I love sort of having um, uh, the world as my reference file so that everything refers to something that's real because if you start there, even with an abstraction, the extra abstractions we have on Girls of the Golden West, everything is based on a real place and real things. Um, so when I have something like uh, the island in Pi, which is um, a total fantasy, I really, I felt I really had to stretch myself and it was, uh, it was hard, it was hard. Like I say, the rest of the film, even with its sort of huge scale, uh, very pragmatic, very easy to kind of figure out how he could approach it, but the island was, was tricky. Do you want to know how he did it? <laughs> uh, you know, um, if you know the story, it's based on uh, the island is all this one organism which is man-eating at night. Um, and so I started, you know, I started researching islands and um, the Pai's journey begins in India. And uh, um, part of the Indian landscape are banyan trees. And banyan tree is sort of like a smaller isolated version of an organism that sort of spreads itself out. And it so happened that Taiwan, in Taiwan, where we were filming, um, where we were filming all of our studio work and our tank work, uh, there was this great banyan tree preserve. And so we went to look at it and I said, and the idea was that we would always build all the island on stage. And um, we went to the location and looked at it. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I'll build anything you want me to build on stage, but you have to promise me we shoot at least one day in this natural setting. Because I just knew that if we had something real to begin with, that the rest of this impossible landscape would work. So that's what we did. I mean, we had to do a lot of uh, work to make that preserve do everything we needed to do, but I just knew that sort of starting with something real would make it work. And that's how, that's how I approached design. So if someone were to ask me to do, uh, as they often do, some you know, superhero fantasy, I just don't know that I'd feel very comfortable with it. That's not the kind of sort of storytelling and designing I like in a ring. Yes? David, did you know that Steve Zaley was an alum of San Francisco State? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, oh, did we know each other at State? Did, well, did you know each other in the profession at Berkeley? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I've tried to get him to a dinner or two, but <laughs> any luck so far. Uh, yeah, no. Um, uh, in fact, I think Steve was actually here for two years and then Sonoma State for two years, but um, he is an incredible talent, and I've been lucky enough to do two films with him. Uh, Steve Zaling is a, he's mostly known as a screenwriter, but he's directed a number of films, including uh, two that I did, A Civil Action, and um, uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer. Um, he also wrote and directed all of uh, last year's amazing series, The Night Of, for HBO. And, um, you know, he wrote Awakenings and Schindler's List and, yeah, incredible talent. Really strong, focused director. Did you run into other ones along the way? Um, no, we were just talking about that. Uh, Jeffrey Tambor was not my time here, was he? And uh, um, 
she was after me. I'm a little younger. I'm at, at um, uh, Santa Fe Opera. I'm working with Paul uh, Horpendahl, who, was, who taught here for a bit. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, how much do you have to do in um, location selection? I'm thinking of films like Better Health. Right. Well, so um, very much so, and um, but as with all industries, things change. So when I started out, um, I was lucky enough to sort of be very, very involved with um, locations at the beginning. <clears throat> so um, for films like The Cider House Rules and Chocolat and um, even Of Mice and Men, before there was any other sort of production crew involved, like with, Cider House, with C The Cider House Rules, I traveled on my own all through upstate New York and Maine and Massachusetts, uh, trying to find the place to center the story. Same thing with Chocolat. I was lucky enough to kind of um, do a tour of all the small villages of France um, before we settled on one to sort of be the heart of that story. Now they tend to bring in the production designer a little bit later. So either, um, so locations might have already been scouted or I might come in and have to scout locations really, really fast. And, um, and because of tax incentives, uh, often I don't get the luxury of saying, I think we're going to Massachusetts for this, or I think we're going to Newfoundland for the shipping news. <clears throat> now they're more likely to say, so we're going to make this movie in Atlanta, or we're going to make this movie in New Orleans. So, <clears throat> but it's, I, I love that part of the work, you know. And I mean, one thing I love about what we do is that you're always, figuring out how to solve a puzzle, yeah. right? So um, I love that. And with the locations, when you do a film, <coughs> excuse me, like uh, the Cider House Rules, where there wasn't a lot of money to build scenery. <coughs> so it was very important that we find an orchard that we could shoot in, an apple farm and a uh, lobster pound and, <clears throat> and the orphanage itself, it's great just traveling all over the Northeast until you find all the pieces and figure out how they're going to all come together. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. Who else has any questions as we wind <clears throat> this down? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, you know, there, there's no, well, there's no question. So I was lucky enough to make relationships here, which carried into my New York career and job offers, and certainly lucky enough to make connections at Yale, which also <clears throat> um, carried me into New York and regional theater, but opportunities because of people that I knew or people who had had a chance to see my work when I was at Yale. So it's important. It's important. And um, so it's not bad to be a little social, you know, and make friends, right? And um, also I did, um, we did, uh, when I was <clears throat> a student at Yale, every year there was a portfolio review, which was an opportunity to sort of show your work to professionals and other professors. So, uh, you, there's no question you need to get yourself and your work out there. And the, for me, obviously, the relationships I made both in undergraduate school and graduate school were very important. I think we have a, a, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm a here focusing on production design, and I just wanted to know if you could briefly describe your design process when you approach a project. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I get a script, <clears throat> and usually, um, 
I mean, I don't like to go into an interview with a director for the first time with, um, with the design. You know, uh, my whole thing is to say to the director, I'm here for your vision. So you tell me <clears throat> what you want it to look like or what direction you want me to go in. Sometimes I might bring research along, but uh, <clears throat> I in no way want to be specific because in film or in theater, it really is the director's um, world, right? And you have to totally support the vision that they want. You don't have to agree with it, but that's your job. I think that's your job. You're not working outside of that. You're working to sort of be inside that person and bring their vision to life. <clears throat> so uh, I read the script. I meet with the director. And then usually uh, I start my research, sort of beginning my career in New York. I always go to the New York picture collection and flip through photos. And now I might use the computer a little bit and um, as well. Uh, and then start bringing ideas. I mean, much to, uh, I hope not to uh, Eric's chagrin. Um, Eric taught me how to render. And then I honed my skills when I was at the Yale School of Drama. And my first couple of um, shows, like my first two Broadway shows, I definitely did great big renderings, <clears throat> but then soon abandoned that for models, which is what I feel most comfortable with. So um, in film, I don't usually do renderings. I just start putting together a massive research, and when we begin to sort of develop a uh, visual language and color scheme, then uh, that then we go into a model usually. On something like Life of Pi, where you have to do a huge presentation to sell the, to sell the <clears throat> concept to the studio, um, I work with an illustrator and we do digital renderings. Okay, so I think we have to wind this up. We're right at two o'clock. Um, but thank you so much for taking the thank time you. to yeah. do this. <clears throat> <laughs>